Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the British Library for Spy Masters, Tudor Surveillance and its Legacy. Since the lockdowns, we have been presenting a wide range of events digitally on our bespoke online platform, and we've welcomed audiences from around the country and across the world. We would like to extend a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We hope that you enjoy this evening. My name is Andrea Clark, and I am lead curator of medieval and early modern manuscripts here at the British Library, and the lead curator of the library's current exhibition, Elizabeth and Mary, Royal Cousins, Rival Queens. This evening's panel discussion is one of a number of public events to support the exhibition, which is in fact the first major exhibition to consider Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots together putting them both centre stage and giving them equal attention. Elizabeth and Mary's turbulent relationship dominated English and Scottish politics for 30 years. But despite their fates being intertwined, the two queens never met in person. Instead, their relationship was played out at a distance, much of it by letter. The British Library holds the largest collection of autograph Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots letters. And it's these thrilling documents that lie at the heart of the exhibition and enable visitors to step back into their world and understand how from amicable beginnings, their relationship turned to one of suspicion, distrust and betrayal. The crisis years of the 1580s, which saw an embattled Protestant England threatened with foreign invasion in support of the Catholic Mary, form the exhibition's penultimate climactic section Faced with such grave threats to the survival of Protestant England, Elizabeth's chief advisor, William Cecil, Lord Burley, and the Queen's principal secretary, Sir Francis Walsingham, understood that the effective use of intelligence networks was critical to ensuring the Queen's safety. Consequently, they greatly expanded the Elizabethan Secret Service, often resorting to underhand and brutal methods. Exhibits including ciphered documents and deciphered documents and letters describing intelligence gathering and encryption techniques demonstrate how Elizabeth's government thwarted the 1583 Throckmorton plot and the 1585 Parry plot before the most famous Elizabethan surveillance operation of all uncovered the 1586 Babington plot, which entrapped Mary Queen of Scots and brought her to trial and execution in 1587. The exhibition is open until the 20th of February, so if you haven't already visited, you still have plenty of time to do so. At the end of the lecture, we will be taking questions from our online and in-house audiences. So if you're watching online, you can submit your questions through the question box below the video. And for our audience in the theatre, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. If you are watching online, you can use the menu above to provide us with feedback on the event, and also to donate to the British Library and to order a copy of the exhibition catalogue. A couple more housekeeping points for me before we get going. For our live audience, uh, please do turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent. And uh, we're not expecting any fire alarms this evening, so if you do hear one, please follow the emergency exit signs. So I'm now um, really delighted to welcome our panelists this evening. Professor Stephen Alford, Stephanie Merritt, Alan Judd, and our chair, Gordon Carrera. Together, they're going to explore the Elizabethan Secret Service and how it shaped modern espionage practice. It is a huge pleasure for me to introduce our chair, Gordon Carrera. Um, Gordon is a security correspondent for BBC News, where he covers espionage, terrorism, cybersecurity, and other related issues. And he's also the author of a number of books related to intelligence and spies, including MI6, Life and Death in the British Secret Service, and Russians Among Us. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you and welcome to all of you here and those of you joining online as well. It's a great pleasure to be able to moderate this panel and explore um, Tudor surveillance and spy masters. I spend my time talking about the modern variety uh, writing and broadcasting about them, but I'm lucky to have an expert panel 
uh, with me to delve into the past and try and explore it. Um, Stephen Olford, as we heard, is a professor of early modern history at the University of Leeds, author of six books on the period, including The Watchers. He is joining us, as you can see, um, online, remotely, I think from the Yorkshire Dales. Is that right, Steve? Um, That's right. Absolutely. Beaming in from a distance, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you're very welcome. Um, Stephanie Merritt, uh, then um, on my left, is the author of 12 books, uh, including uh, Sunday Times number one best-selling historical crime series written as S.J. Paris, featuring Elizabethan heretic and spy Giordano Bruno. The most recent is Execution. I think that's right. Alan Judd, uh, then at the end, is a former member, member of the Diplomatic Service turned author. He's written non-fiction, including about the first chief of MI6, as well as fiction, most of which is set in more recent times, although uh, his most recent novel, A Fine Madness, is about Christopher Marlowe. So this is a chance to explore this fascinating period, which I still think has many echoes today. The MI5 uh, crest has a, 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 a rose in honor of Sir Francis Walsingham. I remember once going into uh, an MI6 chief's office and seeing a uh, painting of John Thurlow as well. And so I think modern spy masters certainly know the importance and the significance of this period in really um, defining a lot of what becomes modern espionage. And I think what we'll try and do is explore a little bit about what it was like then and perhaps also how it differs to where we are now. Um, Stephen, perhaps I could get you to go first and maybe paint us a bit of a scene of the landscape of, uh, in which the spying took place uh, at that time. What were the forces? We think of modern spying really defined by the Cold War, but what were the forces which, which shaped it back then? Well, I think the Cold War similarities are really interesting because I think what we have from the second half of the 16th century across Europe is, is a difficult and fractured landscape. I suppose we might understand it as two competing ideological blocks uh, that the, the long um, sort of duration of a painful reformation Catholic and Protestant the superpower of Europe in the second half of the 16th century in Elizabeth's reign was um, undoubtedly Spain which was the great Iberian power um, but also a global power um, in in many ways um, England was a little bit of an outlier. We might even think of it as a, as a kind of rogue state, a pariah state on the edge of the European mainstream following the long consequences of Henry VIII's break with the Church of Rome in the 1530s. Um, and by the 1560s, we have uh, war and uh, rebellion, uprising, um, in the Spanish-ruled Low Countries, the Netherlands, um, and also dynastic religious civil war in France um, at, the, at the same time. I think religion and dynasty are those kind of two um, elements of the, 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 the kind of bigger landscape, which are really important to understand. Uh, they, they give real kind of bite uh, to the to the politics, to the diplomacy, to the security or lack of security of, of kingdoms and states across the, the whole of Europe. And the reality, certainly from Elizabeth's reign, in Elizabeth's reign, um, is that you know, a fair portion of, of Western Europe um, saw sustained military action uh, and, and, and quite intense violence. England on the edge of that, but Protestant England very conscious, Elizabeth's ministers very conscious, the Queen conscious herself, of being beset and um, embattled. Uh, with Scotland uh, as both a, th a threat and, and an ally, potentially, um, just to the north, uh, and the Tudor Kingdom of Ireland, always a problem, long running uh, series of insurgencies across the second half of the 16th century, and always vulnerable to attack and invasion. So it's really quite a fraught um, picture, which has a kind of Cold War resonance, um, but, but also has that um, extra dimension. Certainly for Elizabeth's ministers, you really find, you know, somebody like a Burley or a Walsingham would see this conflict across Europe 
um, in, in cosmic terms. They, they wrote about fighting the forces of Antichrist. You know, they, they saw their times as the, as the latter days. They were expecting um, the great sort of cosmic showdown um, between heaven and the powers of darkness. And I think that also lends, um, you know, really, really quite a sort of sharp edge uh, to the perception of, of conflict and very fraught diplomacy. So what you get a sense from that is of, 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 of instability, competition, a sense of how much is at stake, and that really drives then the, the, the desire for intelligence on what's going on because of that kind of environment. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's necessary. I mean, in terms of, you know, sheer survival, certainly the survival of... of the Elizabethan state um, of, of Protestant England. It was very difficult, I think, to kind of disentangle those two things, the, the, the Church of England and Elizabeth as, as queen, that those two things, those two elements of the Elizabethan state are very much bound together. Um, Elizabeth's crown was uncertain. I mean, one of the, um, you know, the, the absolutely kind of essential themes of the, the exhibition um, is the potential rivalry uh, for the English crown of Mary, Queen of Scots. So there's a whole kind of dynastic element to it. And there's also that kind of bigger strategic issue uh, for Elizabeth's government of, um, of, of, of war, of Spanish armies, putting down rebellion and resistance in the, the Low Countries, um, those questions of whether to intervene or, or not in that. So there's a kind of military intelligence dimension to this as well. So spies were necessary. Um, now, how they worked it is, of course, one of those things that we can kind of unpick over the, over the next few minutes. There are similarities, I think. Um, so perhaps intelligence organisations and espionage, as we might understand it um, today, but also I think there are big differences also. But the really clear thing is that intelligence work and espionage was felt to be essential for the survival of queen, kingdom um, and government. Thank you, Stephen. We'll come back to some of those themes about what it actually looked like and what it felt like. Um, Stephanie, maybe I can turn to you. What, what drew you to writing fiction about this period and how does it fit in with this world of, of spying and surveillance? Well, I came to this whole landscape of um, Elizabethan espionage through the character of Giordano Bruno. And it, this is quite a tentative link, but um, I'd come across him when I was a student, so um, years ago. And uh, I knew that he was an associate. He'd spent time in London in the 1580s. He was an associate of um, people like Sir Philip Sidney, who was Francis Walsingham's son-in-law and a you know, courtier poet. Um, so he was on the fringes of this kind of intellectual circle at Elizabeth's court. Um, and I started doing a bit of research on him at the time, and I discovered he'd had this extraordinary life. He was um, born in Naples, or just outside Naples in 1548. He became a Dominican friar, and um, but because he had a penchant for reading forbidden books um, and uh, getting into trouble... He ended up having to go on the run and flee his um, convent and uh, he ended up living this kind of itinerant life for the next, well, for the rest of his life, really. He, he was travelling all through Europe, um, the short version. His, he ended up um, at the French court. Uh, he was a philosopher and he um, became very close to the French king. The Catholics didn't like that because he was a heretic. He was being pursued by the Inquisition. Um, so they sent him over to London, where he was a lodger in the house of the French ambassador. This is in 1583. Now, what we know at the time is that um, the first, or one of the, one of the, not the first, but one of the more significant plots against Elizabeth of the 1580s was the Throckmorton plot, which was foiled by the interception of letters passing through the French embassy between Mary's, Mary, Mary Stuart's supporters in France and um, and her when she was um, under under guard, and uh, there was a mole in the French embassy, um, and so it was some some years later that I came across this. I brought this to um, to show you because this this is the book that sort of gave me the idea for the series. Uh, it's by the late John Bossy, um, who was professor of history at York. Uh, he, he died a couple of years ago, and um, it's just it. So he 
had this theory, which I think, I mean, Stephen will probably know a lot more about this, but I, I don't think it was widely taken up or it, it's quite speculative. But there was this mole in the French embassy called, who called himself Henry Faggot or Fagot, um, who is mentioned in the exhibition. Anybody who's seen the exhibition, he's mentioned in these, uh, the letters from, um, to Walsingham. Uh, regarding the Throckmorton plot. And it was John Bossy's uh, theory was that Bruno was Henry Faggot and that he was the mole because he had this antipathy to the Catholic Church, that it was in his interests to prevent a Catholic invasion of, of England. So um, that he was the person intercepting this. And I felt as a fiction writer, I'd always wanted to write about Bruno. And this was like, it was the key that turned in the lock. I thought, well, whether or not it is true and I, I don't think it was um you know I think it, it's still quite tentative the evidence that he finds but there's enough there to make it plausible and so I started writing this this series of books with Bruno working as a spy and at that point that's when I started diving into to all of this well I had to wait for Stephen to write his book The Watchers which has been absolutely <laughs> I wish he'd written it you know um, <laughs> when I'd started these because it, it's just been so um uh, it's been so, it's such a rich source of information. Um, and the, the, the last thing I have to say about this is that uh, John Fossey, when the second book in the series, um, Prophecy, came out, which I think was in 2011, which is the one that's sort of based around the Throckmorton plot, um, John Bossy actually wrote to me and told me that he thought it was ridiculous <laughs> and he thought it was very silly and uh, that, that I... But, um, you know, that's, that's where you... The sort of... The demands of history meet the demands of spy fiction. So, uh... what, what's fascinating from from the brief biography you gave uh, was this sense of individuals being able to move around as well, uh, 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 and and which is obviously very rich territory for spies and people involved in espionage. But it, it feels like a period in which that ability to move between courts and countries was was certainly possible. Well, it was it was unusual actually. I mean, I don't think or, uh, ordinary people didn't yeah. travel yeah. widely. So that I, that's why you know you'll find a lot of the people who were um, who put themselves forward as intelligences or who were recruited were people in the diplomatic service, merchants, people who had a reason to be, to be traveling. And um, someone like Bruno, he was a quite an oddity to yeah. to, to have this kind of itinerant um, he, he worked as a teacher and a, a lecturer. He sort of moved around universities um, before he ended up mm. kind of worming his way into the courts. So, Alan, let me turn to you. Um, plots, moles, these all sound familiar from modern <laughs> fiction, but uh, what, what turned you to go back to, to this period and how different did you find it from what you've written and seen, really, in, in more recent times? Well, Christopher Marlowe... Um, interested me for a long time, um, not for reasons of spying originally, but um, when I was a student, I read a lot of Dostoevsky. I was obsessed by Dostoevsky, and I read almost everything of Dostoevsky. Um, and Christopher Marlowe rather reminded me of a Dostoevskyan figure, maybe of Ivan in The Brothers Karamazov. In the, there's a kind of atheistical, desperate, soul-searching, rigorously, almost brutally logical and in the end, perhaps nihilistic side to him. He was born in the same country as William Shakespeare in the same year. And according to some of his supporters, potentially as great a poet and playwright as Shakespeare, I don't think he would have been, had he lived beyond the age of 29, I don't think he would have matured in the way that Shakespeare did. That's just my opinion. But he was certainly the premier playwright and poet of his time. And indeed, Shakespeare knew him and collaborated with him. And I always wanted to write something about Marlowe. I wanted to write fiction about Marlowe because I'm not an historian. And, um, but I never could work out a way in. And it was really reading uh, around the period and into the espionage of the period, and especially a book called The Watchers by a chap <laughs> whose name I can't remember. <laughs> the second plug the within yeah. five minutes, yeah. not bad. <laughs> Which I do recommend to you because it gives you the whole picture but especially The Watchers, made me alive to um, Thomas Phillips, spelled Philippes, who was Walsingham's kind of right-hand man and one-man Bletchley Park in Second World War terms. And I thought Phillips was such an interesting figure in his own right. I mean, I think he deserves a biography, but I'm not sure there's enough to make a full, full biography about him. 
that I thought, well, he would be perhaps the way into Marlowe. You don't write about Marlowe through Marlowe's eyes. You write about him through the eyes of someone else who's seen him. And my book doesn't concentrate on his plays or his poetry particularly because Thomas Phillips is not that interested in all that. He's interested in the spying. And I have Marlowe doing quite a lot of spying, for which, before Stephen says anything, there is no evidence. <laughs> <laughs> there is evidence that he did confidential work of some kind for the government. I mean, firstly, when he was a student at Cambridge, he was going to be refused his degree, and the Privy Council wrote to Cambridge, and the Privy Council, the biggest guns in the land, suddenly turning on the Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge and the head of Corpus Christi College and saying, you know, whereas it have pleased Her Majesty that her good and loyal servant Christopher Marlowe has done her good work, et cetera, et cetera, does not please Her Majesty that those not know not whereof he was about should defame him. Give him his degree. And, and there's, you know, in Tudor times, as I'm sure you both know very well, there's no, you, you put your hands up at that point. You, you just do it. And that letter, I think, was sent on a Thursday. The degree ceremony was on the Tuesday, and he got his degree, which says something for communications <laughs> in those days. Hmm. Also, when he died violently in a fight that it is believed he himself provoked, the three who were with him, including the person who killed him, all had associations with Walsingham's spy network. So I thought, well, this is enough for me to elaborate on and build on and you know, have, have a bit of fun with. And I've tried to keep more or less to the historical record in that I've involved him in things he could potentially have been involved in because he was alive then. Um, but as I say, there's no evidence that he was. Let's delve a little bit into some of the, the, the detail. And particularly, uh, I think one of the um, areas we could look at is some of the plots, particularly the Babington plot, which I think is one of the central features of this, um, the, the fantastic exhibition that's here. Um, Stephen, I wonder if you could maybe talk us through its significance when it comes to espionage and how it, how it, how, how it uh, the kind of key role intelligence played within that. Um, yes, I, I, well, it, it, it was extraordinarily important defining, and I think subtle operation and picking up on um, some of Alan's themes there. I mean, Phillips is absolutely central to it. Um, it, it it's Phillips who was the workhorse, really, of all the kind of intelligence efforts against Mary, Queen of Scots, um, you know, both in Paris with agents, Walsingham's agents in Paris, um, a, a chap called Nicholas Burden in Paris in the later uh, months of 1585 kind of reporting back over and then Burden comes back over to, to England um, in, in early 86. Um, Phillips generally is the great kind of coordinator, uh, as Alan said, really kind of Walsingham's um, right hand. Um, in seeing the possibilities of gathering the evidence against Mary Queen of Scots that they knew had to exist, they knew that she was guilty of plotting um, against Elizabeth. The, the simple question was to kind of gather that, that evidence and, uh, and, and, and shape it uh, and, and pin it down with absolute precision. So in a way, the, the, the great kind of art of, of the operation is to control the information. Um, a, a little bit like um, the, the Throckmorton plot Stephanie was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, it, it's, it's controlling letters, it's intercepting letters, but it's letting the enemy, um, it, it, it's not letting the enemy know that you have control of the correspondence. So that's Phillips's art, um, I think, both as um, a, a, a handler of agents, uh, and they, they have a young man called Gilbert Gifford, um, who had been recruited um, in Paris, um, as a courier uh, for Mary Queen of Scots to get communications from uh, Paris, a chap called Thomas Morgan, who's really Mary's chief intelligence op officer, um, imprisoned in the Bastille, um, all the way through to Mary, imprisoned um, in the in the English Midlands. So Gilbert was was the man, but Gilbert was picked up, uh, and I, I think was given the choice, you know, to to hang or to um, to spy, and it's really Phillips's control of Gilbert Gifford and another number of, of other um, sort of actors uh, and, and players 
um, including a brewer in Burton upon Trent, um, in this extraordinary kind of complex oper operation, to to in a sense um, get the letters to Mary. Philip's actually sort of helping the secret communication of letters to Mary, but of intercepting those letters, copying them, gathering them, decrypting the information, all this material was, was ciphered, communicating it onto Mary, so Mary and her secretaries, in a sense, have no idea what's happening, but all the time communicating back with, um, with, with, with Walsingham. So uh, an operation of really sort of enormous subtlety uh, and patience and quite extraordinary hard work on the part of yeah. um, Phillips, who was, um, as, as Alan said, you know, to one man, one Bletchley Park, he was a linguist, he was a mathematician, he had that eye and brain to be able to um, break code uh, and, and particularly um, cipher from, from scratch, but he had the key uh, to Mary's secret correspondence. Um, and the key that linked Mary to various groups of Catholic gentlemen, um, of whom Anthony Babington, Catholic gentleman from Derbyshire, is really the kind of key player, and a couple of other important people, a priest called John Ballard, and a whole um, kind of cluster of um, sympathetic, um, but not especially sort of competent um, Catholic gentlemen um, who, who saw themselves as um, uh, Mary's supporters. Uh, but who were entirely sort of surrounded and pinned down uh, by Phillips and Walsingham's other servants over the course of spring and early summer of, of 1586. So it's, it's both a kind of brilliant um, operation in terms of kind of cryptanalysis, um, a, a masterly piece of agent handling, I, I think, by Thomas Phillips, um, who, who really had to be kind of switched on in in, in handling some very, very delicate characters and very delicate moments. Um, but then also the big question mark about method um, as well, because in the end, um, as anyone who um, has seen the exhibition will, will see, um, the final evidence against Mary was gathered, but then manipulated mm. with an element of, of fabrication um, by Phillips in coordination with Walsingham to pin down in a very, very specific way, um, Mary's complicity in a putative plot uh, to murder um, e Elizabeth. So it's an operation which, which really sort of concentrates uh, and uh, elaborates so much about method, um, but, but also about morality as well. Um, and you know, what was, what was necessary in terms of the protection of the the state. Because you're, su you're suggesting an operation which was run long, carefully, quite subtly, but then they also knew what they had to get. At the end of the day, they, they, they believed it was there, but they might have to manufacture some of the evidence to fit, if you like, the policy or the aim. I, th I think that's it. I think there was a very clear um, ob objective. Um, there was a very clear legal standard uh, for, um, uh, for, for, for measuring um, Mary's involvement in any plot um, against um, e Elizabeth, um, and and of course you know they they, they knew she was guilty. Um, they 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 merely needed the evidence to kind of pin that down. Um, absolutely. Um, so it's 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 an extraordinary sort of operation. I think the patience of um, of Walsingham, but certainly the patience of Thomas Phillips. Um, in, in a sense, station very, very close uh, to, uh, to Mary's place of imprisonment, um, Chartley, intercepting the letters, um, coordinating over a distance. Alan mentioned a little bit um, earlier about, you know, perhaps the surprising speed of communication, um, you know, without any kind of modern technology, with simply kind of horses, letters, posts, couriers, uh, um, Walsingham, Phillips um, were able to coordinate not only the operation against Mary, but also to watch um, the plotters and conspiracy, conspirators, Babington and, and so on, on the streets of London to follow them and monitor them. So as an operation of, of watchers, um, it, it's, it, it, it's also an extraordinarily kind of subtle, um, uh, long game played, not just over a couple of weeks, but actually a number of months, really. Very, very kind of slow burn, lots of patience needed.
Stephanie, you've written about this. Haven't you? Yeah, so this is what um, execution is really all based around the, um, the Babington plot. And I chose the title because um, the, the, the quote that I used uh, at the beginning of the novel is a quote taken directly from a letter from Anthony Babington to Mary, Queen of Scots, um, which says, and I'll get it wrong, I can't remember it exactly, but it says, <clears throat> he's, he says to her, um, I have six gentlemen, all my private friends, who for the love we bear your majesty and the Catholic cause um, will undertake this tragic execution, by which he means the assassination of Elizabeth. But it, uh, ironically, of course, it was these letters which led to Mary's execution. So <clears throat> that was, um, you know, and then it ends with the execution of Babington and his co-conspirators. But some of the details of the Babington plot, I just, they, they are, it's so rich for dramatization. It was just, um, it, you know, it, it was just such a, a pleasure to write because, so if, if one of the things Anthony Babington did <laughs> in having got this group of, men together to carry out this incredibly secret plot by which he was hoping to assassinate the queen and um, you know herald a, a Spanish and French invasion. Um, he got them all to pose for a woodcut with their names on. <laughs> with, with their, there, there is this woodcut that exists of all the conspirators. So, I mean, you can just, I'm just trying to imagine them all just kind of standing there for like posing while an artist and maybe one of them saying, should we be doing, you know, it's like doing a selfie before you kind of go yeah. and do a, anyway, so that was brilliant. Um, the brewer in Burton who is, so they've got this fantastic system that, Thomas Phillips and, um, and Walsingham come up with where they're putting the letters, Gilbert Gifford is bringing letters from London, they're putting them into a watertight canister inside the beer barrels that are being delivered to Charlie um, and where they are then fished out by Mary's servants and taken up the stairs to her. Um, and the brewer who realizes he's onto a really good thing because now they can't go anywhere else for their beer, he keeps putting the price up because <laughs> he, because he knows you know, because now he's on the inside of this operation. He knows they Make can't the most get it. Of it. Yeah, exactly. So he just keeps putting the price of the beer up. Um, so all these little details mm. that uh, I just, uh, I found them so fascinating. So um, Bruno, it's like Alan was saying about Marlowe. Um, he wasn't. There's a, mm. there's a good possibility that he was the person involved with the Throckmorton plot. He almost certainly had nothing to do with the Babington plot. But um, at this point, I've got a readership got a who want more stories. <laughs> so he's ended up being a bit like Forrest Gump. I just kind of <laughs> drop him into... Um, I, I have tried to be... So that summer of 1586, we don't know where he was. He was probably in France. Um, but I have gave him a reason to come back and, and get involved with the, the Babington plot because obviously Walsingham did have men inside this group of conspirators who were going into the taverns reporting back what was being said in the meetings. Um, so I just gave that role to... Bruno instead, but they, there's just so much drama in it and these conflicting personalities. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's Stephen who says it might as well have been called the Ballard plot because he was this very charismatic kind of mm -hmm. priest who was uh, behind it. And, and it's such a disparate group of men who've come together for all kinds of different reasons, but mainly looking for a bit of glory and adventure. Um, and yeah, as, as, and the ego of it as demonstrated by this woodcut, which is... Uh, uh, yeah, so it's got it's got so many the, details. The characters right? are fascinating, aren't they? And yeah. as you said, the kind of the, the people out for glory, the brewers out for money. I, I wonder, Alan, what's your sense of how um, how what the, the motivation was for people who got involved in intelligence work back then, and perhaps also if, is it different? Do you think from what they are more recently and what they are now? Well, I think I mean the brewer in your your brewer. I mean he is the one they call the honest man, yeah. isn't he? Um, <laughs> And he's probably honest in, in the sense heavy, that he just honestly wants money. An honest you know, man. That, and I suspect, you know, money was a large, very large part of it for quite a few of them. Whether, you know, who knows, motivations and methods change over years, but human beings, at least in the modern eras, um, have, are fundamentally very similar. And um, I suspect the... I think the modern FBI acronym for motivation for spying, MICE. All right, can you remember this? Money, Money ideology, ideology, compromise, compromise, ego. Ego. I suspect those four just about cover most of it, then and now. I mean, it would be very interesting to know, you know, about the, a bit more about the conspirators of the ba uh, at the time of Babington and all the rest of it, and how. 
you know, what about the role of Robert Poley? I mean, I'm sure Stephen could say a lot about Robert Poley, who is a figure who was integral to the Babington plot. He was also integral to the death of Marlowe. You know, he, was, he was there then. He seems to have been an agent who spied for a long time, well in, into the next reign, I believe. And he did. His yeah. motivation, well, I wonder what. Stephen? Yeah, he did. He did. And it, it, it's an improbably long career, I, yeah. I think, in, in the case of Poli, uh, because he seems, you know, at, at very definite moments to have been absolutely kind of transparently untrustworthy. Um, Francis Mills, Walsingham's <laughs> private secretary, um, really kind of, you know, goes goes at Poli. Uh, in the in the wake of the Babington plot, and he's there. I mean, Poli has this fantastic habit of of of, of turning up at, at kind of questionable dinners, you know. So he's he's there in you know Deptford with with Marlowe, and uh, he's dining in in various gardens and at various taverns with the uh, with the Babington and Ballard um, plotters at, at, at different points. And Mills, Walsingham secretary, doesn't trust him as far as he could throw him. Um, and yet, you know, Poli from that point somehow manages to um, convince uh, Walsingham of his trustworthiness. And he has a really interesting career because Poli is traceable, um, both as a standard kind of courier, um, carrying diplomatic packets to various parts of Western Europe, kind of Antwerp and Amsterdam and, and, and Paris and so on. Um, and yet he also has this kind of secret dimension um, uh, as, as well and a, a, a kind of intelligencing um, career. Uh, and those two things I think are slightly different uh, in, in the 16th century insofar as there was any um, great distinction um, b between them. Um, but I think motivations are really interesting. I suppose, I mean, I right at the beginning of the, the session talks about kind of ideological blocks um, in, in Europe or across Europe in the second half of the 16th century. And we have to be careful, I think, for the 16th century of using a word like ideo ideological, but you know, religious passion um, is, is a motivator um, for, for some. Um, certainly money, uh, I mean, literally for, for some of Walsingham's um, agents, uh, putting clothes on their back and, and food on the table. I mean, they, they literally sort of write um, in, in those terms. Uh, and also, I suspect, you know, sort of, um, you know, ego, playing the, playing the great game, uh, being a, 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 a big player on a small stage or a small player on a big stage, but, but you know, ha having, having the ear of powerful men um, it's also a patronage game, and, and that, um, I, I think, again, is something that is quite different uh, from uh, um, modern in intelligence um, organisations, um, in the sense that there's no set career structure, there are no kind of institutional controls or formal recruitment or, you know, anything like that, really kind of profession in that way, um, but it is potentially a step up the ladder. Um, so doing these small jobs of intelligence gathering, um, of, of spying, of keeping an eye on underground Catholics um, in, in London or beyond, uh, recusant um, Catholics, um, can be a way for some of these individuals to kind of register their talents with powerful individuals and hope um, to, to get on the patronage ladder. Um, so in that way, it's, it's very much a kind of um, it, 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 it's very much a kind of career game, but in quite a different sort of way than than perhaps today, I think. And, and that is a difference, isn't it? It's much more personal. It feels then the allegiance is personal. You hear about personal networks rather than the kind of institutions, if you like, which persist beyond what one person builds. And the loyalty of those spies is often to a, a person in that sense, isn't it? Yeah. I think one you, you've touched on, or you both touched on one big parallel with, with the Cold War, I think. You know, I mean, one shouldn't draw too many detailed comparisons, but in both those times and in the Cold War, you had an, a perceived external threat that had res resonance internally, where you had dissension and division. Yeah. And I think those were both characteristics that worked at the same time in the same way. In the, in the 1930s, in this country and in many parts of Europe, 
you know, there, there were a lot of people who were um, seriously communist in a way that doesn't happen now, or certainly became much less after Stalin's crimes became revealed. But at the time, it was possible to be a respectable Democrat and believe that communism was the future, as many, many did. And so, you know, you had a hostile Soviet Union that actually could play upon this division within the country, just as in those times you had a hostile Spain, mainly, and France some of the time, that could actually threaten to come in and invade and um, overthrow the Queen and kill the government. Mm. See, it's interesting that you say that, because when I started writing this series, the, the parallel that was really obvious to me, so I started writing it in, in sort of 2008, 2009, um, and the parallel that seemed very, very obvious then was with young Islamic men. Mm. So they're, you know, people who, so you've got, you know, in the 16th century, in the 1580s, you've got these young disaffected Catholics whose families have perhaps lost their money and their land, um, who have maybe seen their fathers imprisoned for refusing to give up, you know, refusing mm. Protestant worship. They go abroad to France to these English-run seminaries where they train as missionary priests. They then come back secretly into England with the intention of converting people. And the fear for Elizabeth's government is that you've got these kind of um, ardent young men whose principal allegiance is to their religion, not to their country, mm. and their religion which, which um, makes them more loyal to another country that shares their religious faith or religious ideology. Um, and that's, you know, so to me, that, that, those were the parallels that seemed to, to suggest themselves most obviously when I started um, writing about this, the idea of, you know, people going abroad to study in religious schools and then coming back. Mm. And, and, um, and it was at the time when there were all sorts of um, new legislation was being mooted here about um, <clears throat> detention on suspicion of terrorism charges. And, and when you look at what was going on in the 1580s um, and the stuff that Elizabeth's government were bringing in, it, it's the, you know, the idea that somebody could be arrested for something they have been reading Mm. Uh, or for what they might do rather than something they have done. And these sort of, so the potential that, you know, you're detaining somebody because they've been looking at suspect material. And it, that, to me, it was just seemed such a kind of, you know, quite, quite yeah. sort of, you know, gave me a bit of a shiver to look at the way those, those things compared. Yeah, that's a very interesting parallel. I, I, one of the things that, um, I mean, certain periods get defined by espionage, and clearly the Cold War is one of them. And, 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 and because in popular culture and... Um, uh, as well as in reality, kind of spies become this dominant theme. And you also see sometimes spying itself fuels a kind of paranoia when you know there are spies afoot, when you fear that they might be everywhere, when you don't know who's a spy. You can see these kind of waves of spy fever break out, you know, in, in popular culture sometimes. You saw it in the 50s and the 60s with kind of, you know, the third man and, um, you know, Kim Philby and, and, and so on. And it feels like this period, this Tudor period, was, was another of those where, where perhaps... It, it, it can verge into a kind of paranoia or bunker mentality where you start to see spies everywhere, Stephen? Do you, think, do you think there was a bit of that, a bit of an obsession with spies? Yes, I think so. And, and, and not, I mean, not simply espionage, but I think the, the, the wider picture, certainly for Elizabeth's advisors and, and ministers and, and those close to them, of, of seeing, you know, a whole movement across Europe, you know, step by step, the Queen excommunicated as a bastard heretic, schismatic, um, various kind of plots funded by foreign powers, um, the great massacre in, in Paris in, in 1572, the massacre of the Huguenots, which um, was an extraordinary shock, uh, to, even to uh, hardened veterans um, like Elizabeth's Privy Count, um, the, the assassination of William of Nassau, Prince of Orange, uh, in 1584, the great hero of Protestant resistance against Spain. Each of these episodes, I think, sort of contributed um, to that sense of fear and, uh, and, and panic and made those um, groups 
that Stephanie was talking about just a few minutes ago, I, I, th I think all the more relevant, you know, that they were really worried about the Jesuits. The Jesuits looked like um, the, the kind of ideological stormtroopers of the, of, of, of the Catholic um, Church. You know, their mission was obviously um, political. Uh, it, it was obviously subversive. Um, the emigre groups in the uh, foreign centres, you know, whether it's sort of Antwerp or, or, or whether in various um, towns and cities in, in, in France, um, you know, all, all of those were, you know, suspect individuals. Uh, and, it, and it was extraordinarily hard to, to, to keep very um, consistent tabs on them. Um, recusants at home, the, the, the kind of underground um, Catholic community, even Catholics um, held in prison. Um, the, the, the notion of prisons like uh, Newgate or the Marshalsea or the Plink or wherever it was as nurseries of, um, of rebellion uh, and uh, treason. I think all of these, you know, together um, made for very much, you know, a sort of atmosphere of, of, of fear um, and, and real kind of existential anxiety, I think, on the part of Elizabeth's government. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm. There are some parallels with just before the First World War in this mm. country and in Germany when there was real spy fever on a, on a scale that I don't think we've ever witnessed, you know, with... Um, I mean, newspapers had spy editors in those days and people got prizes, money prizes, for having spotted a spy <laughs> if they could write in during the week. There, was, um, there were novelists such as the most famous was a man called William Le Cue, who was horrifyingly fecund. He could write six books a year, which is going it, isn't it? You know? And um, he was convinced that we were about to be invaded and that there were spies everywhere. And... The Asquith Prime Minister had to stand up in Parliament and deny that there were 40,000 German hairdressers and waiters in this country who were secret reservists waiting for the call on the Tag, the day, to go to an arsenal hidden within a quarter of a mile of Charing Cross and seize the commanding heights of the economy. Of course, Asquith denied all this and said it's nonsense, which just confirmed it in most people's <laughs> eyes because anything Prime Ministers say tends to be... Um, and, you know, as with other spy fe other fevers at other times, there was a tiny kernel of truth in it. Mm. I mean, Germans did not plan to invade us, but they did plan to go to war. And there was a German hairdresser who was a spy. Um, <laughs> Just the one. Uh, yes, on the harbour at Portsmouth. <laughs> and a very, very good place to have one. Because <laughs> who, what did he do? He cut sailors' hair all day. He heard all the gossip about which battleship was going where and which one had been out for how long or which one was damaged and couldn't leave port. Very useful chap, I'd have thought. Uh, just a reminder, if, you, if you're online and you'd like to submit questions, please do. If you're in the audience, start thinking them up. I'm going to come to you in a minute. Just uh, one or two quick questions, perhaps one for the panel, which is um, writing about researching spies is hard. I know that from the modern world because it's secret. <laughs> you know, that's the point of it. I just wonder what it's like in this period, I mean, what's the what's the evidence trail like? What are the the, the sources, Stephen? You know, how much of it is left over, and how different it is is it from other you know aspects of governance, if you like, in, in the period to research? And then maybe I'll come to the, the novelists into what what it's like to try and recreate some of it um, in the fictional world. Stephen first. Well, I mean, it's 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 painstaking and forensic work. Um, the, the material survives. Um, and some of that material has um, extraordinary richness, as the, the, the exhibition um, shows. I mean, the, the, the levels of um, kind of close, fine grain texture and detail, you know, down to blots of ink or sealing wax, you know, is, is you know, e e even I, you know, still, still find that. I'm so used to it over so many years, but, but even um, I, I find that um, extraordinary. Extraordinary. Um, so it can be really rich. Um, it, it, it tends to be a job of um, quite sort of broad range reconstruction. So, um, you know, the, the, quite a few archives, a couple of major archives, but a number of archives um, have material that um, originally in the Tudor archive and the archives, say, of 
uh, Francis Walsingham as Principal Secretary or, or Lord Burley uh, as, as Lord Treasurer, or originally Principal Secretary, um, you know, all that material that would have been filed together. And you can tell it, you know, would have been bundled and, and filed together in, in, in kind of tills and units and various filing cabinets stuffed in the office um, over the centuries for all kinds of reasons has been dispersed. So much of it is... I suppose much of my job is in a sense kind of putting putting all that together and a surprising amount of it um, survives. It, it's, it's a little scattered and a little random. And of course, there are accidents of um, survival. You know, much of the outgoing correspondence perhaps doesn't, um, but letter books and copies and uh, uh, and a material returns does. Um, so it's 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 sort of surprise. It's a mixed picture. It's surprisingly complete. Um, but there are a few obvious gaps um, at, at the same time. One of the, the, the things that always makes me smile a little bit are the number of documents which have something like the formula of burn this letter <laughs> still there <laughs> in the archive. Burn after reading. Um, and, and somebody didn't quite. And, and you, you know, you wonder what's going on there. What, for which you are very through. grateful, no doubt. That for they which did. I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> for which we're all very grateful. Um, and, and, and I guess that the, 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 there's richness in the fiction in, in having some material, but being able to recreate as well for both of you as well. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, uh, you know, I'm so grateful, as uh, I'm sure if you've seen the exhibition, you will have seen some of these documents, the tiny, tiny, yeah. writing Thomas Philippe in particular, the tiny letters and, yes. um, and these ciphers, these really complex ciphers. So I am incredibly grateful to proper historians like Stephen <laughs> who have gone through <coughs> all of this material and then written a book about it, which I... So I have done very little digging in the actual yeah. archives because, because there's so much material yeah. from this period and people have written excellent books about it. So I've, I've sort of started there, but it is... There, for me, there's such a frisson in seeing mm. those documents. And so somebody that, that I have written about, like Francis Walsing and Anthony Babington, you know, to, to, have, to have imagined yourself into their heads and then to see their signature on a piece of paper, it's quite it's ex extraordinary to, to kind of think this was a real person who mm. lived and died and wrote his name on this bit of paper in front of me. Um, but yeah, the gaps make it all the more interesting for you know to to imagine your your way into it, which is um, you know where the where the story begins. I think really. I suppose it's different when you're trying to write about modern spying in, in the sense that we have different expectations of what we want, and we're not going back. We're not going to documents and that sort of thing, as you say. You know, what is secret is secret. You can't go and have a look at it all and. And, and nor would it necessarily make for a more entertaining spy literature if you did, because the two most successful, the world's most successful spy writers, Ian Fleming and the late John Le Carre, you know, they, they both exhibit different traditions of spy writing. And of course, they're both quite unrealistic in, in different ways, obviously. But so is it realism that people really want or do they just want a good story and a bit of a thrill? <laughs> you know, and maybe I sometimes think that the greatest spy writer who hasn't yet appeared um, would be a kind of Trollope and a kind of Anthony Trollope who could do for the, for the modern intelligence world what Trollope did for cathedral closes in the <laughs> 19th century. I, Interesting parallel. He writes about the people. And, yeah. and that because they are, after all, people like us. They are ordinary people. They go to offices every day, they do a job and they come home and they live lives just like everyone else. But of course, if you try to do that in a spy novel, it, it, I have sort of made a half-hearted attempt at that <laughs> once or twice, but it, it doesn't work because people know they want some action. They want some spying. They want some secrecy. They, they want don't want the admin. Dead letters or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know. The bureaucracy so, of yeah, filling yeah. in your forms. <laughs> yes, I, they I, don't want the bureaucracy. No. So, uh, but you can do it with humour too. Yeah. You could do humour. Yeah, I always think what's interesting is the intersection of the individual drama and motivation, which we've talked about, yeah. with great events and, and dramatic yeah. things happening and things being at stake. And that certainly yeah. is the, the feel you get in this period. Now, uh, do, I have some questions already here. Do we have some questions from the floor? Yes, lots of questions. Right, let's get to some. Um, uh, where should we start? Actually, I tell you, while we get to the first microphone, I've 
for here, one in the front. I'm just going to read one from the audience so that um, uh, I get through that. This is from um, Miss Deborah Stokes. Thank you for your question. It seems that Elizabeth's spy network was pretty sophisticated, but where did it come from? Was it something which had developed over the whole Tudor dynasty with Henry the Seventh and Eighth, or was it Walsingham and Cecil that kick-started it? Um, Stephen, what's what's was it something new, or did it emerge and grow out of something? It's it, it's a patchy story over decades. I I think the the Elizabethan iteration of it uh, was something fairly distinct, and it kind of sits in its own sort of Elizabethan um, ecosystem uh, to to a certain extent. Um, but spies and especially informants um, had been important for decades because the big context here I guess is you know the um, the, the, the the power of the the, the Tudor monarchs um, but but also the fragility frankly of, of, of Tudor power especially when it came to to dynasty and and religion so you know in the 1530s um, the process of enforcing the break with Rome um, meant that it was important to sort of keep tabs on potential critics and to, um, you know, silence opponents uh, and and so on. Um, but I think that's a little removed, mm. actually. So, you're, the, yeah, it's interesting. It you're, experience. Yeah, your sense is that there was something quite unique about this period, about the dynastic struggles, about the religious struggles, about the international environment and the security situation, which really... I, made it special and different, yeah, and accelerated. Yes, to some yes. Yeah. I, and I think so, and especially about the 1580s uh, yeah. as, as well, you know, that, that that really is the kind of key, the key decade. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. Question from the front, and then I'll... Um, is one of the differences between the Cold War and the Tudor period that in the Cold War, um, they were up against an equally competent spy network on the other side, whereas from what you're saying, I gather that is it nothing like that really existed on the other side in the Tudor period? Stephen, do you want to go for that one first? Or? Yes, well, it, it, it's sort of patchy, patchy in a sense on the on, on the other side. I mean, certainly um, the King Philip of Spain, the, the, the ultimate kind of monarch bureaucrat um, of, of the 16th century, um, you know, d did have a, a sophisticated um, government system uh, that there, there were sort of occasional fears of kind of plottings and um, spy networks um, in the 1570s and, and 1580s. Um, but whether it was quite as defined um, or as focused um, as the, the kind of Walsing and Burley and, and eventually kind of Robert Cecil um, operation, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think the, the factor that's different is that England was such an outlier. Um, you know, it was kind of the German Democratic Republic, really, of, of Western Europe, um, if, if we want to kind of Cold War um, reference. Uh, you know, it knew it was different. It knew it was right. Um, and it was fighting for survival. And I think that that, that, that sort of sense of, of needing um, the, the kind of intelligence gathering operational sort of counter you know, sort of security operation, counterintelligence operation um, that, that uh, Walsingham and Burley ran, I, I, I think was an element of, of that. Um, it's not really quite, it's not the Cold War parallel um, here, but uh, it, just in terms of um, threats to the throne and espionage networks, uh, there was um, in the French court, because the French King Henry III was uh, was under a lot of threat from his Catholic opponents as well. Um, and uh, his mother, Catherine de' Medici, had this extraordinary, um, I wrote about this in the, in the novel Conspiracy. She had um, recruited a network of uh, young women, ladies in waiting at court. She would find the, the most attractive kind of daughters who, who of good families who wanted their daughters <laughs> to get on at, at court. Uh, and they were called the Flying Squadron. So they were, they were known at court as the Flying Squadron, and she would basically deploy them. If she thought somebody was plotting against her son, she would say to one of these girls, right, you need to go and seduce <laughs> him, and you need to find out from him what he's planning. And she did, she foiled several plots, assassination plots against Henry III, no, it was actually against um, 
one of her other sons, but she foiled an assassination plot and two of these guys ended up being executed because they'd told their lovers what, that they were going to try and kill the king. So there was, there was espionage kind of going on in, in different ways, ways all over this, you know, all, all around the period. I have a question here from a gentleman. Yes, um, Stephen was quite right about the Spanish Empire, of course. The sun never set on the Spanish Empire before the British Empire. Uh, the second thing is that, in fact, um, Elizabeth was a, a, actually a bastard in relation to the other two, so therefore it was more important for her to have spying um, facilities for her rather than anything else with uh, Henry and with Mary. But one of the things that really struck me about Elizabeth was the fact that she re was reluctant to sign the, the death warrant, you know, for, for, for Mary. And I wondered whether there was any evidence that in actual fact she was actually aware because she was a, an intelligent, sensible woman like our present queen, in actual fact to be able to realise that there might perhaps be some manipulation there in the facts as well. Stephen, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, I, 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 it, it, it's pretty clear to me that, that she was briefed all the way through um, the, 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 the development um, of, of the Babington um, plot. I think her reluctance to put her signature, her sign manual to, to the all important document that essentially is, you know, eventually sent out to Fotheringay and, and um, you know, le leads to Mary's execution. Um, there's probably a little bit more to do with Elizabeth's kind of natural instinct for self-preservation and her great talent for kind of plausible deniability. I mean, on the day that, that she signed um, the, the warrant, uh, the, 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 the document, um, within hours she changed her mind and, and there's a whole other story there about the implications of, of, of that for her poor second secretary, um, William Davison. Um, she, she ordered through Davison and through Walsingham um, Elizabeth's private, uh, Mary's private assassination, um, you know, kind of secret um, assassination. You know, the message went to uh, Samia's Paulet, Mary's keeper, to, you know, do, do his duty uh, and, and dispatch the, the Queen of, of Scots, which he refused to do. And conscience so in in a sense I, I, you know it, it, elizabeth was was brutal you know when when she needed to be uh, she 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 knew the necessity of, of getting rid i think by that point um of, of mary i mean those twin poles for elizabeth of you know do 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 we find some sort of way of of integrating mary back into into the system of of, of coming to a treaty of coming to an agreement or you know do we do we eliminate? Mm. Um, and, and by early 1587, you know, cl clearly elimination was the was the only possible um, option. So, I mean, it's a it, it's a wonderful moment. I mean, it, it's 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 possible to reconstruct, but the 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 stories and certainly Elizabeth's version of the story um, of, of what happened on that all important day um, mm. is um, is complex. I mm. think. A question over here. Hi, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the actual techniques that spies used. And you touched upon it when you were talking about the ciphers that the letters were written in. But I wondered, like, what kind of codes were used? How did people crack the codes? And also, did they use any of the techniques that we hear about in modern spy fiction, like dead letter drops? And mm. was there that kind of system of handlers kind of grooming their spies? Um, how, how similar was Elizabethan spying to the kind of techniques that we see in modern spying? Who wants to go first well, for that? I just, and if you, if you, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the exhibition, but there's one beautiful example of um, a letter that's got invisible writing on, and they would use, you could use um, alum solution. This is again, you know, Thomas Phillips had this this great kind of arsenal of tricks, um, and Walsingham employed. Uh, there was another um, <coughs> guy called uh, Arthur Gregory, yeah, Arthur Gregory, yeah. who um, who was um, could reconstruct wax seals so he could forge seals and so you you know you it would look as if the seal had not been tampered with um and so there's a letter in the exhibition where you can see the the secret writing that's been revealed with with holding a flame to it and they could use they would use orange or lemon juice if they could get a hold of it or alum solution um and so there's all these tricks mm. that, that uh, tricks that you sort of are in your kind of children's spy kit that you get <laughs> when you're little you know and, um, that's what what i love mm. about it because it's some of these techniques as 
so sort of easy, but they they worked, and they, yeah. you know these yeah they were using those quite quite frequently. Uh, I mean, some of the things you see in the, the exhibition, like frequency analysis of yeah. things, some of these tricks are, are similar to what you see in the 1930s. Aren't Very they? similar, and I think what what tends to happen is that the technology of spying, if you want to call it that, follows the technology of the times, whatever it is. And frequency analysis, as you say, which I think was invented by the, or discovered by the Arabs, I think, mm -hmm. some time before, um, as a way of, you know, I mean, you know, a very basic example, the, the letter E is apparently the most commonly used letter in English. So if you look at a page of, of jumbled up letters or, or symbols, and you pick out the most common one, and that might be E, you know, and then you work on from there. So that when you get more sophisticated forms of communication, you get more sophisticated forms of intercepting that communication. Because a lot of spying is about reading other people's communications, what they say to each other. And basically, we were doing it then, we're doing it now in the same way, but just in very different, rather more complicated ways. Mm. More questions. A question here from the lady in the middle in um, black. The microphone's just coming from behind you. I just wondered that um, Elizabeth's opponents would know that Walsingham and Burley were very, very important to her. Um, were there any assassination attempts on them? And also, what happened to Walsingham's? network when he died did did it carry on Stephen? yeah oh, oh no Stephen. 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 no no, no Stephanie, go, go, go ahead yeah go ahead um no well i was just i mean it was taken over by um, burley's son robert cecil who was then um sort of took over but walsingham was he, he was such a linchpin and such a figurehead i'm i that's kind of out of yeah. my period once it gets into robert cecil so Okay. Yeah, I, it, yeah. Um, Burley, Burley really takes over uh, in 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 a sense, and and um, went through um, with, with the vice chamberlain of Elizabeth's household. It was kind of formal, um, sort of supervised handover of um, secret documents. Uh, Walsingham had a. It, it's described as the black box, as well as other. Um, special sort of cipher cabinets with tills and, and various documents. And Vice Chamberlain Thomas Hennage and Burley together uh, supervised the, the removal uh, of many of those documents from uh, Walsingham House on the wonderfully um, sort of named Seething Lane near the, near the Tower of London. Uh, and, and those documents were taken to, to Westminster. And really together they, 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 they went through um, and pruned back um, those agents uh, and uh, sources um, on the on the payroll, finding that that, that some of them were probably Spanish um, agents or um, were producing intelligence of a very little value. So some of the agents carry on, um, and when Robert Cecil uh, became principal secretary, was appointed principal secretary in 1596. He he took on. Um, a, a number of, of individuals, and Robert Poley um, earlier from, from the, the, the Marlowe Babington um, sort of connection there. Poley is one of them. Um, and Robert sort of recruited a, a, a number of, of others. And by 1598, Robert Cecil really had a pretty effective sort of network of um, information intelligence gathering, really designed in a very um, conscious um, sort of way for, for most of Western Europe um, and, and, and sort of Central Europe and, and Scandinavia. Uh, much of it sort of based through mercantile connection and quite a sophisticated system of, of passing correspondence through various um, towns and, and places. And in some ways, you might even say a little bit more sophisticated than the, the Walsingham um, operation. In terms of assassination plots, certainly there were intimations of plots um, against um, Elizabeth's ministers. Um, Burley intercepted a plot uh, or, or at least received advertisement that he, he, he was a target. He was going to be picked off by an arquebus um, somewhere near Charing Cross um, in, in 1571. So occasionally they kind of pop up 
although in, in terms of security and protection, really, Elizabeth and her ministers were, by modern standards, really pretty seriously unprotected mm. um, in, in, in many ways, which I think is interesting. Mm, it is. We're nearly out of time, but I think I saw one more question from the gentleman over here. Um, you've drawn parallels with um, the Cold War. I'm interested in the Napoleonic Wars, and I can sense parallels there as well. The concept I keep coming up against there is, is the agent provocateur. Have you encountered that role that far back in Tudor times? And do you, do you, have you seen any examples of that? Where the government effectively is, is planting someone and to, to create a crisis that they can Stir then manipulate. I think there are examples, aren't there, Stephen? But often yeah, I, I, I think scale, so. That, but, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, there, there are certain moments at which there are scares about, um, you know, uh, sort of plots and, and, and conspiracies um, at um, tactically sensitive sort of moments. Um, so in those wobbly weeks before um, Elizabeth signed um, the, the, the document um, that, that uh, session trained the, the whole process of executing Mary Queen of Scots, uh, a, a plot is um, discovered um, associated with the, the household of the, the French ambassador um, there's a bit of a question mark over that, you know, uh, a, a number of um, powerful individuals are kind of sent off to, to investigate, and it, it doesn't seem to have a huge amount of substance um, about it, but it, it does raise the level of kind of anxiety and um, expectation, really, uh, and, and fear, um, at really kind of, kind of key political moment. Um, so... There are suggestions and intimations, I think, of, 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 of that. Uh, and the same is true of various putative plots in the, in the 1590s, I think. And of course, there's the, the final paragraph to the, the bloody letter, wasn't there, that, that um, Walsingham and Phillips created yes. to make it absolutely clear that Mary was guilty and then didn't use, did they, in, in mm. her trial, it wasn't used. Mm. Yes, yes. So that was a fabrication. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, I'm afraid we have run out of time. Um, thank you all for your questions, uh, whether here in person or online. I have learned an enormous amount <laughs> about a subject which I found absolutely fascinating. And it just leaves me to thank such a wonderful panel of Stephen, Stephanie, and Alden. Thank you um, thank so you. much. For <laughs> just like to um, conclude by thanking you all for being our audience this evening both here on site in the Knowledge Centre at the British Library and also online across the country and um, overseas. For those of you who are here this evening, um, Stephanie and Gordon have very kindly offered to sign copies of their books which will be on sale in the foyer outside. Just to say if you've enjoyed this evening's panel discussion, um, we have an exciting range of events coming up, including Tudor Fest on the 4th of December, which is a day dedicated to exploring Tudor life. Um, and we would love to welcome you back here for more lectures, conversations and performances. So please do keep an eye on the what's on page of our website for more information. And remember, if you've missed any of our recent events, you can catch up on those on um, the British Library player. So um, I think all that remains for me now is to ask you to once again say a very special thank you to our panel for a fascinating discussion and a really wonderful evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>